Welcome to The Filibuster, the podcast of the Union University Political Science Department. The filibuster is the right to unlimited debate. However, we will be limiting ourselves today, but we do hope to reflect the civility of the world's greatest deliberative body, the Senate. My name is Seth Brake. I'm the visiting assistant professor of political science, and I'm joined by Sean Evans, the professor and chair of the political science department. Today, we're going to be discussing the dysfunction in the House of Representatives and recent events. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Thank you for having me here. This is a little bit different for me. I'm used to being the host of the podcast, and now I am the interviewee. Yeah, well, it's a little different for me as well, but yeah. we're discussing <laughs> things that are a little different politically, right? Yes. <laughs> so there's been some dysfunction in the House of Representatives. Uh can you just tell us what's going on? Yeah, I, I think at the heart of it, what we see is that we have weak parties and strong partisanship. Mm. So the idea is that when polarization is high, the policy differences between the two parties are so great that major bills pass on party line votes. Yet party leaders have lost the uh, ability to reward and punish members to maintain, to maintain party unity. Moreover, when you have small majorities like the G GOP's nine-vote advantage, that means a small cohesive group can threaten to defect from the party to extract concessions to maintain its support, and that's what we have been seeing occurring this past year. So there, there's a lot to unpack in that. Uh, can, you, can you explain to us what party unity is and what it means? Okay, when we're talking about party unity, it's basically – how often a member votes with their party. Mm. And basically what we see the norm today is you vote with your party over 90% of the time. When we're looking at the past, we're looking at something where uh, you, you'd have people vote 60%, 70%, but now the out, outliers may vote 80 to 85% with their party. And you also talked about the ability to reward and punish members. Can you talk us through what that means? Yeah. So uh, the base, basic idea is that the leaders, like the speaker, are empowered to pursue party goals. In fact, it's even more important when the two parties are as ideologically homogenous, but yet divergent from each other. Mm -hmm. That leads the parties to empower party leaders even more. And so basically uh, what goes on is that party leaders have committee assignment powers, fundraising powers, um, and other ways to reward and punish me members. What we have seen occur is that other members have developed resources to challenge leaders in terms of their organization skills, the rise of the conservative media, the rise of ideological uh, donors, and uh, just the fact the party cultures <laughs> differ allow the more conservative people in the GOP to exert more power than those in the Democratic Party. So this is new then? I will say this is new, yes. So the, this mm -hmm. is something we've seen over, over about the last 20 years or, or mm -hmm. so, or new in a modern sense. It's, this is similar to things that we have seen in the past, though, but we're ta talking 100 years ago. I'd, I wasn't alive then to <laughs> remember that. So is this largely something that's going on in the GOP? No, uh, this is going on in both par mm. parties. So just think back to President Biden trying to uh, g uh, advance his Build Back Better plan. The moderates uh, pa had formed a coalition to pass a bipartisan transportation bill in the House and the Senate. But the progressives said, we're not going to vote for it unless you vote for the uh, – I think they called it the Human Infrastructure Bill, which was a large expansion of, uh, of the social welfare state. And basically, they held up passage of this for about six months or so uh, until uh, eventually they said, okay, uh, we're going to have to disconnect these votes because we need a win. But, of course, when they did that, they lost their leverage to get the moderates to go along with the plan that they wanted. So we have seen it in both parties. Okay. Now, that makes sense. Um, 
why don't you walk us through how we got where we are? Because, first of all, what happened? And then what led up to it? Okay, so uh, for, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the organization angle here. Uh, mm-hmm. In ter- terms of a lot of the opposition to McCarthy has come from the House Freedom Caucus. So to understand this, we have to remember that Congress has always had in, in independent-minded members. The difference today is that there are more members who are loyal to their ideology than the par- party, and these members also tend to be disdainful of the legislative norms necessary to run the institution. Now, historically, these types of members either lost re-election due to their ineffectiveness and did difficulty raising money, or they learned to play by the rules of the game, or they were punished and ostracized. But what's different is there's now a caucus, the House Freedom Caucus, which is there to support them in their obstructive me- measures. Mm-hmm. Though to e- even to look at the House Freedom Caucus, we have to go back to the 1990s with Newt Gingrich. So Newt Gingrich was the Republican whip who said, hey, we haven't been in the majority for 40 years. We have to be confrontational with the Democrats, tear down the institution if we're going to win. And he had success with that. So what happened was you had the, uh, that when the Republicans took control in 1994, what they did was they elected a lot of people who bought into those ideas and who had never been involved in politics before. Mm. And so they didn't understand how the legislative process works. And so what happened is they took hold of those aggressive tactics and they even turned it against their own party leaders. At one point, they tried to depose Newt Gingrich as speaker. And so what we have seen since then is we've seen other type type of people develop. The Tea the Tea Party people were kind of a new extension of that. You had the Trump populist develop. And what what you have is the House Freedom Caucus is kind of a combination of the leftover Tea Party members and the Trump populist who almost hate the uh, the Republican establishment as much as they hate Democrats themselves. Hmm. And so what happened was uh, Speaker John Boehner tried to corral some of these members by removing them from committees and doing other things, which led the far-right members to say, okay, we need to push back against this. And so after uh, they lost an election to lead the Republican Study Committee, which is the traditional conservative caucus, caucus. They lost because they thought the party leadership told more members to join so that a far-right person would not win. So they decided to create their own caucus with the express purpose of pushing back against the party leadership and to push them further to the right. And so what what makes them different is that they decided to limit themselves in, in size to about 35, 40 people you cannot join. You have to be invited to join, which means that they can make sure they remain cohesive in that everyone in the group supports what the group wants. And they passed a rule that said if 80% of the caucus votes something, it binds all caucus members, which means when you've got that much unanimity, that gives you strength to go to the leadership and say, hey, there's 35, 40 of us who aren't going to vote for this. You need to work with us. And so these members ended up forcing John Boehner out, and that led to Paul Ryan to take in his place and then Kevin McCarthy. Now, what they tried to do was that they tried to co-opt members of the House Freedom Caucus by bringing them into leadership strategy and policy meetings, and they tried to reward them with better assignments. So that's kind of part of how we got to this and to how we have this group that exists. So the, the strategy then of trying to reward them with these positions 
what, did that just not work or what, what happened? Well, it worked with some and it did mm-hmm. not with uh, others. So uh, ma- many of the House Freedom Caucus mem- members, so take someone like Jim Jordan, who was ostracized by the party, uh, started to say, okay, I'll start voting with the party a bit more. I'll try to work with the leadership on things, but they still kept their views of, I want certain things done, but not every member was willing to do, to, to do that. And that brings us to the speaker election okay. in earlier the, this year. Republicans had a nine vote margin. That means if they if they lose five votes, they cannot elect a speaker. And so there were a group of, of about 15 members who said, okay, we just don't like McCarthy. We don't want him to win. What didn't they like about McCarthy? Okay, well, part of, of what they did didn't like about McCarthy is, um, well, McCarthy is more moderate. Uh, if you look, he's probably in about uh, 40th percentile in the uh, House Republican Party. But the other, other thing is they think McCarthy, and this is true on some, some level, isn't really committed to policy on some level. McCarthy is in it for the game. Uh, I, I, I think one, one way I would describe uh, McCarthy is he, he is ambitious to be something, not necessarily to do something. Okay. And I think that alienated some members of the um, uh, House Freedom Caucus. Okay. And, the, and, and the other thing is he's been in the leadership for about 12 years, and they're like, okay, you're part of the pro- problem from their per- perspective. Okay. No, that makes sense. So walk us through what happened then. Okay. So – Basically, the idea is small n- n- numbers. Any defection gives you more power. And so mm-hmm. the idea is if you're the last person you need to get the votes for something, that gives you more bargaining power. And basically what they eventually did over 15 by, by ballots was make uh, McCarthy promise to do a couple of things. One, to allow one person to bring up a motion to vacate. Two, they had to provide plum committee positions for members of the House Freedom Caucus, which meant that they got an extra committee chair, chair chairmanship. And in fact, he put three Freedom Caucus members on the House Rules Committee, which is kind of the traffic cop of the House, which meant they could team with Democrats and stop mm-hmm. any bill from going to the floor. So he basically gave the Freedom Caucus, a veto over what goes to to the floor, and he promised to return discretionary spending to 2022 le- levels. That, that would be a $75 million cut, and it would mean the repeal of all the money that Biden pushed through with his Build Back Better plan. So basically, they may, made him make a promise he was never able to keep. That makes sense. Yeah, because the idea is when you control one third of the political branches, you cannot impose your will on others. And so they set up McCarthy to fail so that when it came time to put these appropriation bills, there weren't votes on the floor to pass appropriation bills at the 2022 levels. Um, And so we got got to the point to where they had to – pass a bill to fund gov- government or sh- shut them down. These members of the House Freedom Caucus are fine with shutting the government down because they represent very safe districts. So they're not going going, going to be hurt by, by this. And McCarth- McCarthy said this isn't good for us, and he brought up a clean uh, continuing re- resolution that would fund the government for 45 days at current funding levels. So there's two things I think I need some clarification on with this. So the first thing, just from an intuitive level, I would think that if you have a house that's so evenly divided, you would think that would lead to compromise with the other side. You would think that a, a very evenly divided house means that you have to work, the Republicans would have to work with Democrats to get things done. But it sounds like the opposite's happening here. 
So h- how can that be explained? Well, I mean, that, that deals with the strong partisanship idea. The two sides have such differing views they can't work with each other. Now, the idea, should McCarthy have tried to make a deal with more moderate me- members to vote pre- present? I think there's a good case for that. But one of the norms of Congress today is work within your party. The idea is there's disincentives to try to be bipartisan um, in that regard. And, 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 and I think this also gets to some of the other things that makes it difficult for party leaders to get what they want. One is the rise of the conservative media um, in environment. So it used to be you had the mainstream media and everything else, but now you, you have Fox, you have Newsmax, you have one of... Uh, America, you have Breitbart, all these other groups. What you see is these conservative members go on these outlets and they attack the leadership for selling out. And so that that gets that angers Republican activists who then contact their elected members and say, stand up for conservative principles and everything else. And so the leadership is losing a lot of their power that way. It's also because the, the, these, these people, since they're so far right, they, have, they struggle raising funds. So the leadership used to be able to show up and do fundraisers for them to get them the money to get reelected. Um, but now they can go on TV, radio, talk radio, and these other sites and make appeals for money, and people will respond. So take someone like Jim Jordan. When he ran for speaker, I read he had been on Fox News 565 times since 2017. Wow. And that gives him the chance to get his name out. It also gives him a chance to um, say, hey, donate to my campaign. And so here's someone far far right, has never passed a bill since he was elected in 2006, and he raised over $14 million in 2022. He doesn't need the leadership when things like that happens. What's also important is what we've seen is the rise of ideological super PACs where you get rich people who believe in your idea to put money into a super PAC to support you and to attack other people. What we've all also seen is that with campaign finance reform, we have lessened the role of parties in raising money, increased the funding provided by individuals. Now, most people say, well, that's great. We don't want to increase parties' yeah. powers. We don't want to increase interest group powers. But what kind of people give to campaigns? What we have found is that individuals who give tend to be more ideological in nature. And so what, what, what we see for someone like Jim Jordan is he raised 85% of his money from out of state. So why is someone from outside of Ohio given to Jim Jordan? Because they're committed to the ideological things that he does. So what you see is these ideolo- ideological members can survive in ways they could not in the past because they can raise money, because they can get on conservative me- media and push their agenda. And Okay. Well, one final thing. The yeah. other thing I'd say is they're helped by the party culture. Mm. The GOP is a vehicle for conservative ideology. So what this means is that Republican vo- voters generally prefer Republicans to defend conservative principles yeah. rather, than co- rather than compromise with Democrats. This leads to a focus on ideological p- Purity, which lead many Republican activists to see any compromise as betrayal and allows the far right to say these people are rhinos. And the concern with these people is I'm going to be challenged from the right, which leads them to move further to the right, even if they think it doesn't make sense. Now, isn't there a sense in which that's just good representation? Isn't that what their, what their uh, voters want? Well, it means they're representing Republicans. Republican activists. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they're representing their district's mm-hmm. voters. So remember, even in, in an age where we see that districts are drawn to favor one party or the other, what we have to remember is even when that's the case, you have a lot of independents and others who may lean Republican or conservative, lean Democratic or liberal who are voting for people in that part party. So if, if we think about it, they're not representing the median voter in their d- 
district, they're not even representing the median Republican voter in their district. They're reflecting more the views of the activists who yeah. knock on doors, who give money, who are further to the right or in the Dems further to the left than the average member of the party. So it sounds like there's a widening disconnect between their their donor clients and their electoral clients. Is that kind of what you'd say there? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So when we left off the story before, okay. we, before we got distracted, yeah. yeah. So it seems to me like the Freedom Caucus had gotten what they what they wanted from from McCarthy. Well, it's up. Well, and it's up. They didn't because mm. they weren't getting the appropriation bills at the levels they want, wanted because McCarthy couldn't round up the votes for it. And then when he went with the continuing res, resolution uh, to find more time to do it, Matt Gates, who has a personal vendetta against um, uh, McCarthy for some reason, uh, decide, decided to use the, the motion to vacate. And the thing to remember with this is Nine Republicans jo- joined him, and all the Democrats. Ninety-eight mm. percent of Republicans supported McCarthy in voting to not vacate the speakership. So this narrow minority joined with Dems yeah. to remove a Republican speaker. Let me let me pause you real fast and ask for a point of clarification. Then, um, what is a continuing resolution, and why were they frustrated about that? Okay, a continuing resolution funds the government at the levels that they have been at in the previous physical year Mm -hmm. for a period of time. What they wanted was a shutdown thinking that this gives them more leverage to extract more concessions from the Democrats. The problem is what we have seen is every time Republicans have tried to shut down the government, they've never won the political battle for a simple fact. Everyone expects Congress to do the one thing that they are required by the Constitution to do, and that's fund the government. Okay. So we now have a new character that's entered the entered the story here, um, Matt Gates. So is he part of the Freedom Caucus? What's going on? Well, there? he's not part of it, but he's very associated with it. So uh, Matt Matt Gates, a member from Florida, he's part of a political family there. His father served in the state legislature. Gates served in the state legislature. What's different um, with Gates is that Gates is a show horse. Mm. Gates is not a legislator, doesn't pass things, doesn't try to pass things. His, His job is... I'm going to be on as many radio, TV, and other outlets as possible. So he's just basically there as a rabble rouser. Uh, He he kind of uh, reminds me, uh, well, the idea is uh, traditionally they make a difference between show horses and work horses. The work horses are the ones who do the heavy plowing to make sure things get done. The show horses are the things that look pretty but don't really do anything Mm -hmm. at all. Um, And so because Gates isn't really productive on things, some people refer to him as an or as an arsonist of sorts. He's trying to burn down the house, Mm -hmm. but he's not coming up with a replacement. Or as uh, former Speaker Sam Rabin used used to say, any idiot can tear down a barn. It takes a carpenter to build one. And the idea is Gates is the one who tears down the barn. He's not willing to do the work necessary to persuade people to join them on the things that he considers to be important to try to advance conservative ideas. He just wants to get a media appearance so he feels good about himself and, hey, he can raise some money too. So it sounds like we have two different visions of what it means to advance conservatism in the House. Yeah. So, I mean, the the thing to remember this, the House Freedom Caucus, they are on the ideological extreme. Mm -hmm. Under an open process, whatever they want will never pass for the simple reason that it's too far out of the mainstream. So the only way that they can be effective is by playing political hardball. And this is when they use aggressive and ruthless tactics Mm. to make people to agree with them. So remember, nine vote margin, there's 35 of them. You don't do what we want, then 
yeah. we're not going to vote for this. And so I, I, I think this is part of the pro- pro- problem is hmm. if you want to advance conservative ideas, are you better off threatening people mm-hmm. or trying to persuade others and the general public to advance your ideas? And that's not what I see them doing. And right. I think that's really poor leadership on their part. Okay. You you need to go. You need to put in the efforts to convince people in in and outside of the legislature that your views are best, and I don't see them doing that. All right. Well, before we get too deep into the strategy of how that's going to work, yeah, can you can you finish the story about what happened with McCarthy and the speaker race and all that? Okay. So what happened was, the question is, why didn't the Democrats save McCarthy? Yeah. Is part of the question. And that's because, uh, just like McCarthy broke his word to Gates and uh, others because he couldn't negotiate at that Democrats were upset because he negotiated a funding agreement with Biden and he was abandoning that. So he broke his word to them. And McCarthy, remember, I mean, the way I described him was he's ambitious to be something, to be someone, not to do something. He would do anything to get his position, which meant, okay, he knew he couldn't get the funding for the House Freedom Caucus. So instead, he said, I'll throw other things to them, like I'll launch a impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden the week before he wants the Democrats to bail him out. And so basically the Dems were like, why are we going to help you? And they were also thinking, hey, this is Republican dysfunction. Y'all need to work this out. And by not supporting this, hopefully this will help you push back against the House Freedom Caucus. Though I think the other way you can look at this is you also have to think about it from the Dems' perspective is what comes after McCarthy, something better Mm -hmm. or something worse? Um, And I think that's what they're going to try to figure out if this was a wise decision or not in the coming weeks and months. All right. So is that the end of the rise and fall of the McCarthy saga then? Yeah, I think I think so. Well, with that, I might have to yield the remainder of my time here so we can discuss the rest of this next time. Thank you. All right.